So in newly sonorous fashion, we are opening the uh, April 17th um, School Board of Directors meeting for the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. And if you do talk news things, it does echo. Um, so first we'll have uh, public comment. Um, this is an opportunity for the board to hear feedback from the public on whatever topic they want to bring to our attention. Uh, uh, my fault, sorry. Can I go? Yeah. Uh, we do not respond in real time. Um, this is time for us to listen, uh, but we do try to ensure that um, all matters brought to our attention are, are handled. Uh, and sometimes this can mean it's just part of our deliberative process in terms of the information we take in as we make larger decisions. Um, uh, and also, uh, if you are not comfortable in public comment, we certainly um, take emails at uh, school board at mpsbt.org. Um, so with that said, anyone who would like to make public comment, um, either in the room, please raise your hands or online, uh, use the raise hand function. Uh, or if you don't know where that is, uh, I think if you just go off camera and, and make some some noise. Uh, so is it one person online? Uh, so we have one person online, Amanda, if you wanna go, I think Anna will let you yeah, yeah. give you speaking power. Thank you. Um, I can talk now, you can hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep, we can hear you. First, I want to say that um, I encourage every caregiver to vote yes on the budget. I support our educators and students and I am here in response to the equity audit. My name, is, my name is Amanda Garces. I'm a parent of a fifth grader and a second grader. Today, I find myself back in the role of a concerned parent Returning to any school board meeting, I realize I'm still holding a mixture of emotions from my departure as a school board member in November of 2022. I departed with a heavy heart, lingering trauma, and I don't say that word lightly, and a profound sense of responsibility to my community. I remain silent about the reasons behind my quitting unexpectedly, despite being open to providing an exit interview had it been requested by the board or, or administration. I had many reasons to leave, but I stayed longer than I should have. I hit a breaking point when I was denied adequate time and resources to review a crucial report pertaining to a parent's complaint about a bullying incident. As someone deeply engaged in advocating for educational equity statewide, it became apparent to me that both the superintendent and the school board chair lacked genuine interest in fostering meaningful processes for caregivers in my community, further evident by the recent fallout in the Roxbury process. Like many caregivers in our diverse community, I have experienced a sense of alienation. In connecting with other BIPOC parents of students who are neurodiverse, I've witnessed firsthand the resilience and trauma they are enduring. What unites us is a belief in the potential of our community and the importance of advocating not only for our own children, but for those who might lack privilege and resources to speak up. Whether it's addressing literacy struggles learning disability diagnosis, or seeking justice for racial harm within our school system, parents who possess valuable insight into their children's needs have been sidelined and disregarded, leading to further trauma and disillusionment. Many are exhausted from tirelessly advocating for better outcomes for their children. As I reviewed the equity and special education audit, I am continually disheartened by the superficial effort towards equity within the administration. When it comes to racial equity, I have seen board members sign signaling that we must lower the standard of the equity po policy so that it could be met instead of actively embracing anti-racist principles, recognizing the inherent value this community brings. I urge the new iteration of the school board to prioritize action over rhetoric to ask the tough questions and to represent the voices that are often marginalized. We must consider the well being of students with disabilities, BIPOC students, LGBTQ students, and, who, and others who may be overlooked. We must do better. When caregivers have reached out to me, I know that I and others have reached a point of exhaustion. 
This has come with the performance of many members of the school board and the superintendent. If wearing us down was their aim, they have succeeded. I have been unable to continue to support many caregivers because giving to a system that ruthlessly treats caregivers as the district's as with adversaries has left me exhausted. In our district, caregivers intimately acquainted with their children's needs should be recognized as valuable resources for educators. Fostering a mutually beneficial partnership, our community has time and time again demonstrated its resilience, whether during COVID-19 pandemic, right, witnessed the collective effort of our 400 individuals in the Montpelier Mutual Aid Initiative, or amidst natural disasters like the flood, where the community, community rallied together, contributing food funds, resources, and time to restore our town. This resilient embodies our community ethos, yet regrettably, it's not how the administration perceives us. Prioritizing investment in our students now promises far-reaching benefits for our society. While I will tell you about the myriad of statistics highlighting disproportionate representations in Vermont justice system, I believe that empowering families and fostering open dialogue are crucial steps towards ensuring everyone feels heard and could serve as a force to drive meaningful change within our district. The administration and board must abandon the notion of viewing caregivers as adversaries. It's high time for fundamental shift in this approach. In my final endeavors, I hope you consider the following. We cannot claim a lack of funds without first establishing a comprehensive and strategic plan that spans, spans at least five years. To address the present issues of staffing, resources, and support of students with diverse needs, it's imperative prior to prioritize planning that can shed line of the long-term resources needed for the well-being of success of all students. And yes, this includes those who want AP classes and better sports facilities. Reorganize the school board with the new board chair and vice chair who regard the community as equal partners, prioritizing the safeguarding of students above all else. These leaders must actively engage in strategic planning, acknowledging the interconnectedness of various issues and the imperatives of holistic solutions. We must transcend empty rhetoric and embrace decisive action. In the realm of special education, our goals must focus on supporting students and teachers. Our goal, our current goal of reducing students requiring tier three supports to a mere 5% of each school's student population by June 2024 is misleading. Rather, our objective should resolve around increasing resources to ensure all students in need of tier three support receive adequate assistance. Presently, we are witnessing premature withdrawal intervention support, leaving parents confused, and those who can afford who can afford it are seeking seeking costly private tutoring after school. But what about those that can afford outside tutoring? On the front of racial equity, it is imperative that we delve deeply into the principles of anti-racism, a value in, in, in strength in this community fabric, I believe. The equity policy is not just for BIPOC students, it benefits everybody. Listen, really listen to parents of BIPOC children and parents of neurodiverse children. Learn with them. Make it clear that racism has no place in each of the schools and work towards a shift of culture. Make that clear and shown into curriculum policies and clear and transparent guidelines. Make it loud, not just in the halls of the school or in a paper hidden among other documents. Have a very clear plan on how you will actualize the recommendations by both audits and the resources needed to accomplish them. Use the state resources. The Act One Working Group recommended a beautiful, beautiful framework for ethnic studies. Use it. And I last, I want to say that supporting our students goes hand in hand with supporting our educators. They deserve access to good professional development opportunities, adequate resources, and a supportive work environment where they can thrive and continue to excel in their roles. We have amazing educators doing right by many of our students. Listen to them. Their insights and experience that are invaluable in shaping policies and practices that ultimately impact student success. Do not relegate this work to only one individual. This is a all-hands-deck approach. 
Thank you for your time. Any other comments? Okay. All right, so now we go to the consent agenda. Um, the consent agenda is essentially items that uh, are pretty pro forma in terms of approval that don't require um, deliberation or discussion, things like approving minutes from the last meeting, um, approving new hires, co curricular contracts, which are coaches. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion or things people want to pull off? I just have a question. Um, whether your superintendent report was six days ago, the legislature has been a flurry with activity and discussions, and I wonder if there's any new updates that could be provided um, about bills moving around. So the bill mentioned in the um, super report was the yield bill. Um, it's gone through several iterations at this point. Did they vote it out of committee today, Joe? No. You know? no, they did. They did. They did vote it out. Not unanimously, but they voted it out. But it's just not going to go to the floor until Tuesday. Yeah. So it's it's um, got. Uh, my Anna says that something's going on with the audio. And, and is that my fault? No, it's almost like the Zoom mics are off and we're only hearing the room. So it's pretty echoey. It changed right after public comment, something with the Zoom mics. <laughs> we're not sure why. Maybe it will. I'll talk yeah. nice That's and loud. Better. That's better. Oh, okay. <laughs> we flipped a switch. He flipped a switch. We're all set. Um, okay, so the yield build has gone through some iterations. It got a lot of comments from fellow legislatures as well as the VSA, VSBA, and VASBO organization. I can tell you that Christina Kimball, our business manager, has been rather um, obsessed with watching House Ways and Means right now. She's watching it constantly, as am I whenever I'm in my office. Um, so the, the the presentation today was about changes to the CLA, which were, it doesn't really change anything. It just moves the numbers around a little bit. Um, the CLA looks to have the same impact as it always has. It just comes earlier in this formula, it looks like. Am I explaining that right, Jill? Um, they're, changed, they're thinking about the ballot language. I did not see what the final iteration on the ballot language was. Um, and they're talking about potentially changing up the funding formula in the future through task force. They're going to do some studies with task force right now. Did I miss anything major? I was asked Jake because I was stuck in a bunch of other committees, so I actually am not as up to speed as Jake might be. Not to put him on. Jake, the spot. did I miss anything? Were you in the room today? I know you were. Both Jill and Jake were referenced today, which I thought was fun. Um, I wasn't at the state house, but I was watching from from tax. And um, no, I don't think I don't think you missed anything. Um, yeah, the 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 CLA change um, is to try to stabilize CLAs, um, but it'll make the yield um, you know not go up so much when the real estate market is wicked hot. Right. Um, so I, I think that could be good. And yeah, big task force. There's like two two big groups. Um, there's a future of education, which is really wide ranging, and then this um, this task force, which is going to last like ten years and basically monitor the education fund. Um, so two groups, and then <clears throat> on the ballot language, they're going to bring back the per pupil spending amount and change from the prior year. Um, which I think was suspended the last couple of years, but it, that was originally from Act 46. Did they strike the last line in the excess spending for the ballot language? I 
I missed that part today. Yeah, they did strike that. Um, and the excess spending threshold is going to be um, back basically how it used to be. Um, so they were thinking about kind of like a variable threshold that depended on what your spending level was, but they nixed that and they're going back to something that's very similar to the way it was um, a few years ago. Which in my memory, we never hit. So, so yeah, there's been a lot of changes. That's a really good question, Kristen, in the six days. Ways and means have been busy. Mm -hmm. so we'll move to the floor for voting in a week. Is that what I mean? Sorry. There's that too. Um, so it'll go to the floor for vote in a week. In a week. Right, so it just got out of the House Ways and Means Committee. So yep. there will be other committees looking at it. And even mm -hmm. though the Senate doesn't have it yet, they're obviously looking for it. So yep. my understanding is it's going to the floor for the House on Tuesday, and then it still needs to get okay by the Senate as well. But yep. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any further discussion? I was in favor of the consent agenda. Say aye. 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 Great. So next we are having the equity audit presentation. Um, sure, so we have um, Carla Manning joining us, Dr. Carla Manning. Welcome Dr. Carla. She has been working with our district um, in creating the equity report. It was in the board packet today, the final version. And Myron Russell is also here, who is Carla's partner in crime um, who has helped with the organization and um, has been a significant part of this process as well that we really appreciated. So thank you both for being here, uh, Dr. Carla and Myron. And um, Carla, are you all set to go? I think you can probably share your screen as a, as a panelist. You can't? This is host no, I can't. Anna, can you make sure that Carla can share a screen? I mean, I can share it too, but it, I think it will be easier if Carla can share it or can just do it on the fly. All right, your co-host now, Carla, you should be all set. All right. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, we are happy to be here. My name is Dr. Carla Manning and I'm the founder of the Equity Leadership Group. Um, we have been partnering with you all um, over a year now um, to help you all with this equity audit report. Um, so this presentation essentially is, um, is a, a comprehensive summary of our findings along with our analysis. Um, and then we also have recommendations. So um, this report uh, provides us with some insight as to the current status of diversity, equity, and inclusion within the district. Um, if there are any comments or questions that any of you may have, we just ask that uh, you either transcribe them in the chat box um, or, of course, if you are okay with waiting patiently until Q&A, we'll take all questions and comments until then. All right, so thank you, everyone. Um, we have a brief agenda here. Uh, we'll talk through what uh, sort of equity um, looks like in the state of Vermont. We'll also provide you all with our definitions of equity audits and what this means for us. Uh, we'll share with you all the demographics um, of Montpelier as has been provided to us. We'll also explain our methodology um, in terms of how we uh, collected the data. And then we'll share with you all our um, domain areas as well as suggested next steps. Okay, so in terms of what um, uh, the sort of the current status of, um, of equity. So, um, in 2018, Montpelier Public Schools was the first school district in the nation to raise the Black Lives Matter flag on its high school campus. In 2019, the state of Vermont, um, specifically the Ag Agency of Education, um, included specific policies and directives about educational equity in their state plans. In 2019, Montpelier School District developed a board-approved policy on diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
In 2020, the governor of Vermont received a report from the quote racial equity task force, which describes how different areas of Vermont governance either perpetuates or mitigates racial equity within the everyday lives of Vermont residents. And then also since 2020, the Vermont School Board's um, Association has released various statements um, and documents as well, explaining their position about equity and anti-racism. Um, so this, this um, overview is important because it provides a cultural, social, and political context, as well as an educational context uh, for Montpelier um, concerning diversity, equity, and inclusion. All right, um, so in terms of how we are defining um, equity audits and educational equity. So educational equity, the way the equity leadership group defines it is that it is the provision of resources, supports, and tools necessary for every child to succeed, regardless of their identities related to race, gender, socioeconomic status, um, ethnicity, family language, religion, et cetera, neurodiversity, et cetera. Um, educational equity also assumes approaches that are anti-biased, anti-discriminatory, culturally responsive, in order to create a teaching and learning environment that promotes justice, access, inclusion, and belonging for its students. Equity audits then are leadership tools that district leaders can use to help develop equitable and inclusive policies. Equity audits also provide us with an opportunity to identify and analyze barriers that may impede full participation, access, and opportunities. And then equity audits also allow the district to, um, to examine itself and to examine the existence of um, equity gaps while analyzing the root causes. So an equity audit is essentially what we've conducted, uh, what the equity leadership group has been conducted um, to complete. All right, um, in terms of the demographics, so Montpelier Roxbury Schools is the 21st largest school district in the state of Vermont. As of December 2020-23, Montpelier serves more than 1,200 students who together speak about 15 diverse languages. And then in terms of the racial demographics, um, again, this was the data that was provided to us. About 83% um, of the student population identify as Caucasian white, 1.5% as Black or African American, 2% biracial with Black and white. About 1% identify as Hispanic and Latino, another 2% biracial with Hispanic and white, about 5% of students um, are Asian, um, a small 0.16% uh, of student population identifies as Hawaiian Pacific Islander, 0.58% um, as American Indian and Alaskan, 2.6% other, and then almost 1% unclassified. Okay, um, before we get more into the uh, meat of the report, um, are there any questions or comments that, that deserve immediate attention as of this point? Don't see anything, Carla, keep going. Sure, okay, thank you, okay. Um, so in terms of methodology, so uh, this is an explanation as to uh, how we collected the data, what data was collected and how we collected. Um, so the specific data points um, that we collected primarily came from focus groups, uh, focus group interviews. Um, some of these focus group interviews were virtual and then some were in person. Um, for the ones that were in person, you know, we had the pleasure to meet um, if we did, when I was there in um, late October, early November. Um, we also conducted surveys, um, and there were two surveys um, that were shared with the Montpelier community. Um, one survey was specifically for teachers and instructional staff, and then another survey uh, was asked to be completed by everyone um, within the district, including teachers. So essentially teachers had the opportunity to complete two surveys and they were the only um, stakeholders requested to do so. Um, but the other survey, the equity survey, everyone had the opportunity um, to complete that survey. Um, the only caveat that we included with the um, equity survey, the one for everyone, was that um, 
students could identify students and caregivers could identify as one group, whereas the caregivers only had that option for themselves. So essentially, if a student completed a survey, it was not specific enough to say, okay, this was a student, because the student survey um, essentially was combined with the parent survey in terms of um, who responded. Um, so in terms of the data analysis, um, we triangulated the data. So what essentially this means is that we try to um, connect the data to another source of data um, to essentially verify it. Um, so an understanding that if there's one data point that we received, what other data points were provided to us that could either supplement or verify or even negate something in another piece of data. Um, also for our data analysis, we work to identify um, patterns, themes, and consistencies. So what, uh, what similar ideas and similar um, patterns were consistent throughout all of the data points that we collected? So when we began to identify uh, particular patterns and themes, we then conducted a deeper um, level of, um, of analysis, of thematic analysis. Um, we then coded and themed the data um, using um, Johnny Saldana's uh, uh, framework for thematic analysis. Um, and then once we had those themes, we then created um, deeper level questions to interrogate um, what, we, uh, what we came up with within the themes. And then of course, interrogate the data itself. Um, so the data collection process and the data analytical process was a very fluid, hybrid, um, comprehensive process that involved um, multiple, multiple lenses um, as well as multiple practices. Um, a lot of, well, I should say a lot, all of the consultants who participated um, in this research project, all of us, um, have extensive background in academic research. So we also apply various um, lenses and various frameworks to help us um, analyze the data. Um, some of those lenses, for example, included um, critical theory, um, critical disability studies, critical race theory, um, various uh, social theories, um, so on and so on. So um, again, the data collection and data analysis process uh, was a very uh, comprehensive process. All right, so after we collected the data, uh, we developed sort of a, a domain um, uh, inquiry-based framework, if you will, to help us understand um, the, the larger domain um, issues, the larger domain themes that showed up. So this is not, um, all sort of all inclusive. There could have been additional themes or additional domains, I should say, but uh, but to keep things in a way that is accessible and digestible, we decided to stick with these six domains. Mm -hmm. Domain one is leadership and policy. Domain two, culture and climate. Domain three, family and community engagement. Domain four, human resources. Domain five, curriculum and teaching or curriculum and instruction. And then domain six is equity of access. Um, so essentially with all of these domains, uh, you know, the big picture question is we're asking to what extent do we see equity and diversity, equity and inclusion within these six areas, right? So to what extent is Montpelier moving forward in these areas? And then to what extent is, is Montpelier either not moving forward or uh, you know what what issues are obstructing diversity, equity, and inclusion from moving forward within these six areas? Um, so so yes, that's that's essentially what we're asking here. Okay, um, so what we're going to do, or or how I or how we uh, presented the information in terms of the findings and our analysis. Um, in this slide deck, uh, we chose a, a simplistic approach in terms of how we um, are sharing the information. So for each of the domain areas, what I'm going to do is provide you all with high level observation statements, or we could also say analytical statements, 
but there are several um, high level statements within each domain area. I'll read those statements um, and then we can unpack them right then and there, or we can wait until the end to have deeper discussion. Um, and then I go right into the recommendations. Um, the report that we have provided you all has, of course, a, a much um, uh, comprehensive and detailed analysis for each of these domain areas. So again, for this presentation, we're just hitting, hitting the, uh, the high level points, um, but, but we'll ask that you all refer to the report itself um, to, to receive the deeper level narrative that we provided. All right, so domain one, leadership and policy. And the question that we're asking is Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools taking a proactive approach to teaching and leading their students and staff about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so based on our findings, we came away with uh, two major, okay. Uh, we came away with uh, two uh, major findings. Um, so the first statement, um, the main concept here is diversity, equity, and inclusion, leadership, vision, and community feedback. And um, based on our analysis, we found that many respondents emphasize the desire to see the district leadership um, embrace a stronger, strategic, more active, and visible approach with implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in its classroom, schools, and workplace. Another finding that we developed is that there, uh, district-wide, that there is a lack of accountability specifically in addressing racial issues. So um, some respondents described a lack of leadership accountability in addressing systemic issues related to race, racism, racial bias, ethnicity, and racial and cultural discrimination. Um, in terms of our recommendations, um, how can the leadership take a proactive approach? Um, one uh, recommendation that we have obviously is to build leadership capacity um, to organize, to steer, and to lead diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Um, uh, you know, there are a myriad of ways that we can build capacity. Building capacity includes professional development training. It includes leadership coaching. It includes mentoring. It also includes the usage of um, courageous conversations. It includes the usage, uh, excuse me, uh, the leadership skills in terms of how to develop curriculum, how to teach curriculum. Uh, there are a variety of ways in which um, leaders can develop their capacity for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Another recommendation that we have is that the district may benefit from having an equity communication plan. Um, an equity communication plan specifically um, would be a communication plan that documents the specific communication strategies that the district will utilize in discussing or talking about or even leading and implementing DEI initiatives. So essentially, you know, what is the district doing about diversity, equity, and inclusion? And then how are those efforts and initiatives being communicated to the larger district community? That is some of the information that will be included in that equity communication plan. And then lastly, um, there has to be some accountability in place. And um, again, accountability um, can be a comprehensive initiative, even in itself. Um, but we can start with developing specific metrics of success. So we can, um, so the district can have conversations around tracking data, reporting on the data, and essentially measuring success. So what does diversity, equity, and inclusion success look like for Montpelier? How are we going to keep track of that? And how are we holding the district accountable um, to not only implementing those DEI metrics, or excuse me, DEI um, initiatives, uh, but, but keeping success, keeping track of that success. All right, uh, Libby, you know, should we pause in between each, um, each domain or should we wait to have deeper conversation at the I'd end? Have good question. I'd have, if it's okay with the board and okay with you, Dr. Carla, I would have the board write questions down and then we'll come back later because I want you to be able to finish your slides. I don't want to run out of time. Does that work for okay. you, Carla? I see nods Absolutely. from the board members. 
Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that we uh that that we have room for, for Q and A. But yes, that that's that's fair lady. Absolutely. All right, okay. So um so we will proceed. Um, domain two is culture and climate. So how does Montpelier create a school culture that promotes belonging and inclusiveness for all students and staff? So, uh, so we developed five various observation statements. So a lot came up um, within our analysis, uh, specifically on this topic. Um, so the first statement, microaggression and insensitivities in student interactions. So this theme captures the complex dynamics of peer relationships, including instances of discrimination and insensitivity, and highlights the challenges in fostering a respectful and, and inclusive school environment. Um, another statement is that there are inconsistencies with establishing a welcoming and inclusive culture. So while there is an awareness of diversity, equity, and inclusion in terms of how it's implemented varies um, significantly across schools, and then also there are some inconsistencies around um, in terms of creating a disjointed experience for student staff and families. So in other words, how, how some people um, experience the culture and climate of Montpelier varies um, from um, uh, within, within the respondents. Safe spaces and belonging, and this was a, a topic and conversation that came up a lot um, from various stakeholders. So, um, so we shared here that while Montpelier has created spaces and resources for students by focusing on school spirit, uh, there is intentionality of positive language in the BIPOC space. Um, however, there are opportunities for the district leadership um, to um, have specific conversations about the BIPOC space centered on understanding and awareness, student safety, and then um, strategic planning in terms of ensuring um, uh, the safety and success of BIPOC, uh, uh, of the BIPOC spaces. Um, so this, I, I, I really want to bring a lot of attention to 2.3 because I think um, specifically for some of the students, this is a conversation that deserves um, some careful um, and considerate conversation and discussion. Uh, 2.4 is another conversation, community trauma and performative progressiveness. Uh, many members of the internal district community and surrounding community felt that um, some policies, procedures, practices, and initiatives to address inequities and mitigate disproportionality have fallen short of meeting their goal, of uh, meeting their goal, and remain surface level. Um, again, uh, for us to write 2.4, there were um, there was some data collected um, that was strongly speaks to this uh, particular topic. 2.5 is another conversation that, um, that we believe deserves careful attention and that there are socioeconomic clashes. And we can even say that there is a sort of us versus them mindset um, within the district. Um, and so the merging of Montpelier and Roxbury School District um, has created a district with, with shared resources. However, there is still a divide and a feeling of an us versus them mentality, um, uh, primarily affecting um, families, children, caregivers within um, the Roxbury Village. Um, and so we also understand even um, within this conversation that this is a current, um, a current and complex issue with Montpelier, um, even at this very moment. Okay, um, so some of the recommendations that we have is that uh, we think that uh, that we can that Montpelier can address specific instances of exclusion to foster a more inclusive atmosphere. So um, there were yes, I'll say that. Uh, the second point that we have again going back to communication, so developing a transparent communication strategy with the district's community stakeholders as related to its anti-hazing, anti-harassment, anti-bullying and anti-discrimination processes, protocols and procedures. This was a major topic that came up. Um, so we, we think that a strong recommendation in place can be focused around um, communicating equitably, um, specifically around various HHB 
instances um, and experiences. And then um, also going to um, my uh, MTSS. So thinking about um, how to implement an MTSS program with an equity lens or a culturally responsive lens or framework. Okay, um, family and community engagement is domain three. So is Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools effectively engaging all communities to hear their needs and perspectives? So one of the statements um, that we um, developed is that uh, focused on community engagement and education. Some respondents emphasize the need for DEI education and we can say awareness in the community, highlighting gaps in understanding and the importance of tailored programs to foster inclusivity. Um, the feelings of, of uh, unheard, feeling unheard or feeling ignored is another concern um, that rose uh, from respondents specifically related to family and community engagement. So some respondents describe feelings of being ignored by the district or unheard, um, calling for more empathetic and responsive school approaches. Another statement, marginalized voices in the community. Um, there is a need for Montpelier uh, district leaders as well to ensure that the voices of parents of color and other marginalized identities are heard and incorporated into decision-making. And then lastly, student and family engagement. So some stakeholders stress the importance of inclusive and meaningful engagement with students and families in DEI policy and practical discussions. Okay, so in terms of some recommendations for family and community engagement, um, Montpelier Roxbury schools can increase opportunities for families, students, and staff um, to voice their needs and provide feedback that informs district decisions. So not just listening to parents and listening to caregivers, but actively taking um, some of their concerns um, into uh, decision-making as it relates to policy, as it relates to practices, as it relates to processes, particularly families of historically marginalized identities and communities. And then there are also opportunities um, to have public discussions specifically with Roxbury parent, family, and caregivers to strengthen relations. So um, based on some of the data we, that we collected, we found that there are missed opportunities. So there are opportunities to have very um, specific discussions and even courageous conversations on specific issues affecting Roxbury um, families and caregivers. Okay, so domain four. Now we want to say for domain four, which is human resources, um, looking at the hiring, um, retention and promotion practices. Um, we want to say for domain four, our the data that we collected for domain four was was um, solely qualitative, meaning that our data was um, primarily informed from interviews and focus groups. Um, we did not develop our analysis for domain four based on any quantitative data. So that we did not use any quantitative data or statistical. Um, HR data provided uh, from Montpelier, that did not happen. So our um, analysis for domain four was only based on um, qualitative data and not quantitative data. Um, so three of the statements that we developed um, for uh, domain four, one is equitable hiring practices. So Montpelier's efforts to implement equitable hiring practices face challenges due to varied recruitment strategies and transparency and systemic barriers, despite recognizing the importance of diversity. So um, recruitment and recruitment strategies we thought could um, use some more DEI support. Uh, retention of diverse staff was also a finding that we observed. So despite hiring qualified and diverse teachers, the district faces challenges in retaining staff and faculty of color due to prevailing culture and thin equity initiatives. So uh, while the hiring may be there, keeping and retaining um, diverse staff remains a challenge. 
And then also um, parent participation in hiring. So parental involvement in the school district's hiring practices is seen as positive, but limited and symbolic rather than substantively, uh, su substantively influential, highlighting the need for more significant and impactful parent participation aligned with DEI goals to enhance staff diversity and inclusivity. All right, so specifically in terms of recommendations for human resources, um, you know, obviously we want to develop a targeted plan um, with strategic initiatives aimed at attracting individuals from diverse backgrounds. So this deserves a, a, a very, very specific conversation itself in terms of um, what a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan would look like for human resources. Um, but that is a recommendation that we have. And then also a second recommendation could be a focus more on workplace wellness and then even um, thinking about workplace wellness uh, with the diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So um, um, workplace wellness is a, um, you know, sort of a hot topic right now. And with, um, with a lot of HR departments uh, placing emphasis on retaining employees and, you know, essentially helping to make employees happy, workplace wellness is a strategy for that. All right, uh, curriculum and teaching. Again, curriculum and teaching, um, this, the, the data that we collected um, was qualitative. Um, however, um, our, our analysis was informed primarily by interviews and focus groups. So uh, for domain five, we did not um, utilize or have access to specific curriculum materials within the district so that uh, us not having that access um, also uh, provided us with the ability to, to analyze what we have. But I just wanted to, um, to make that clear here. So three, uh, three findings that we have, um, curricular inclusion and differentiation. So there is an identified need for the district um, to teaching with an inclusive and differentiated curriculum catering to students and catering to all students emphasizing the importance of adapting educational content and methods to diverse learning needs and backgrounds. So, you know, an opportunity for more culturally responsive curriculum here. Uh, 5.2, a lack of diverse representation in curriculum. So a minimal presence of cultural representation in the curriculum has left a noticeable gap in acknowledging and embracing diverse cultural backgrounds within the curriculum. And then students' input and teachers' attitude regarding curriculum. So some students express mostly positive experiences with their teachers and curriculum, but also believe that the curriculum was not representative of their identities. Teachers, on the other hand, felt that their lessons were differentiated and culturally responsive. So there's some, um, uh, while teachers on one hand feel that their lessons are culturally responsive, some students felt that essentially that was not the case in terms of representation. All right, so recommendations for domain five. So how can the district's curriculum provide interdisciplinary learning experiences for students that strengthens their sense of identities? Um, so one recommendation that we have is that the district can conduct a curriculum audit with a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So an ongoing curriculum audit is assessing um, curriculum with a rubric that is looking for various aspects of DEI or culturally responsiveness. Offer consistent professional development training is another recommendation that we have. And PD training emphasizing um, DEI, anti-bias, anti-racism, or culturally responsive approaches. Um, so again, providing those specific PD and professional learning opportunities for all staff. And then another recommendation is to include diverse student voice in instructional practices, and then also within lesson planning in itself. All right, um, equity of access is the last domain here, being domain six. So the questions that we're asking um, within domain six are all Montpelier students provided equitable opportunities to learn and thrive academically and emotionally? Are there any systemic barriers to student success? 
And are there any identified equity gaps in school data? Um, so one observation statement that we have is that um, there may be some socioeconomic challenges associated with participation in extracurricular activities. Um, I'll just read through these uh, sort of high level here. Um, another finding that we have is around the implementation of um, inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion within the multi-tier system of supports, MTSS. Um, there can be um, a 6.3 statement. There can be a deeper understanding and around addressing student behavior and discipline and disproportionality. Um, 6.4, continuous improvement. So efforts to promote um, equity face inconsistencies, um, highlighting the need for continuous improvement in staff development. And then the last finding that we have is um, focused on community partnerships. So the establishment of partnerships with local businesses and, com and community organizations is crucial for providing additional resources and fostering equity and support. And so the major recommendation that we have for domain six is um, to continue the MTSS practices and to have a deeper um, implementation of MTSS and social emotional learning with an equity approach or culturally responsive approach. Um, so in a nutshell, these are the six domain areas that we have. Um, and then in terms of moving forward, um, our immediate recommendations for um, next item action steps. Number one is to establish clear and common language around definitions. So we think that there are um, a lot of opportunities for the district to be very clear on what diversity, equity, and inclusion means. So how is the district defining these terms? What sort of vision or mission statement can be articulated um, that captures um, the district's definition? And then what are the goals that the district is establishing that is aligned with this vision? So currently um, outside of the policy that is in place, I don't know if the district has a clear definition a clear vision for diversity, equity, and inclusion, nor are there any clearly articulated goals for measuring success for DEI. So we would uh, suggest and recommend that this would be the first starting point to get very clear on the definition, the vision, and the goals. Um, the second area of recommendation is creating these authentic spaces for parent and family community engagement. Um, right now, as you all know, obviously, there is a lot happening with Montpelier, and um, there are a lot of um, perspectives that a lot of people have. So I think, well, we think that there are opportunities for the district to um, create safe spaces, safe and authentic spaces. Courageous conversation spaces do not have to be aggressive. Um, courageous conversations do not have to be um, confrontational. Um, and, and of course, they do not have to be um, violent in any ways. So we can work together to create these safe, authentic spaces to have courageous conversations on hot button issues and topics. And then also within those authentic spaces, being very clear on what, I, what the ideal community engagement looks like. So what does it look like um, for parents and families to ideally come together within Montpelier? on specific topics. And then lastly, as we mentioned before, a, a big element um, that the district could benefit from is establishing these accountability systems. So this is also aligned with um, point number one with the definitions and the goals. So once we have identified the definitions and those goals, let's start thinking about accountability. Um, so number one, who are some of the individuals in the district to oversee progress? Who are these people? Are they are these folks who are on the board? Are there specific leaders that have been appointed? Are there specific parents? Um, who are the people who are in charge of overseeing progress? What does that progress look like? And how is that progress being communicated um, to the district community? And then also, what does a timeline look like? So in terms of um, articulating these goals and articulating this accountability system, how can we hold ourselves accountable as a district 
to ensuring that these strategies are implemented over a period of time. So it's not um, so it's not just happening just to happen. It's happening with a specific um, deadline and time date in mind. All right, so I have been quite the chatty Kathy for the last 30 minutes. Um, I would love to be silent at this point, and we would love to hear you all's questions, reflections, thoughts, comments, takeaways, feedback, all of that good stuff. Now is the time for us to have some conversation. Great, thank you. Uh, questions for uh, Dr. Carla? Or comments or reflections? Scott, you look like you want to go. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Carla. Uh, it's really nice to, to see you again. Um, that was a lot. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think my take home is that we're pointed in the right direction, um, but have a long road ahead of us. Um, I think I think you you acknowledge the the systemic um, issues that not just Montpelier Roxbury public schools is facing, but the state of Vermont, um, those systemic barriers that that we um, that our society um, has in place. Um, I will say the narratives that that you shared are consistent with those that I've heard from from family members. Um, in our community. Um, and I've also heard them outside of um, our community. Um, I, I'm curious to hear your, your perspective on, um, based on what you saw, how, like how do we, how are we doing relative to other communities? Like, um, are there examples that you can point to of like who we should be aspiring to to be more like or be, you know examples of best practice that sort of thing um uh so that we can yeah you know see see examples of what we want to aspire to that's that's good scott is yes i can provide you with examples <clears throat> i can provide you with school districts that I think are um, sort of leading the charge. It's hard though, because the demographics are different. Yeah. It's like some of the school districts that I would recommend in terms of uh, being sort of vanguards, their demographics look very different from my years. So that's the thing, a lot of the demographics and a lot of what I would say is success, a lot of it is happening within school districts where there is a large culturally and racially diverse population and where there is a lot of racial and diverse population within positions of leadership, right? That's not the case of Montpelier. So I, I would have to do some homework to try to look up some of those examples, but, and we, and, and this is an excellent question and one that deserves conversation because in some ways, you know, we think that Montpelier is, um, you know, making some very strong and positive movements, but then also given the demographics and given the current realities, there are some things that are like, oh, I don't want to say it can be a hinder, but it, it may pose a challenge that's very unique to Montpelier. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's the only thing. Um, you all, there's a lot of buy-in from Montpelier around diversity, equity, and inclusion. That is... <laughs> That is a, a, a topic that is may not be the case for other school districts yeah. where you have other school, other school districts where you have the need for DEI, but there is no buy-in. Like, are you serious to hire a consultant to come in and do an equity audit? No, <laughs> we're not doing that. So the very fact that you all made this choice and this commitment to move forward with this work shows a large buy-in right there. So that, that's a question, Scott, that deserves some follow-up. But, but in the meanwhile, um, of course, you know, I would be happy to provide you all with some districts. Yeah. Um, right off the top of my mind, um, I would say Chicago Public Schools, I believe, is, is a uh, district that is very much leading this work. Um, 
they have uh, like an equity department, equity mm. officers. Um, another district is Atlanta Public Schools. Um, another district is my, uh, Montgomery. It's a district in, in, in uh, Maryland. Mon M MCPS yep. is the, um, yeah, Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, those are three districts that come to mind. Um, but again, those are districts that are large urban districts. Montpelier is not a large urban district. Um, these are, <laughs> you all are like more of a, of a smaller suburban district or rural um, or combination, if you will. Mm. Um, so, th so there are some differences though. Yeah. That's, that, that's my answer right there, Scott. That's my, that's my final answer. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Carla. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, and following up on that, are there, yeah, being a largely white state and a white town, are there strategies that we can employ to attract particularly, you know, more diverse leadership and more diverse staff? Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, Jim. Um, that deserves a deeper conversation, of course. Um, but some, some immediate starting points would be, and I always like to say, um, to develop partnerships with historically Black colleges and Hispanic serving institutions, and specifically developing partnerships with those teacher ed programs or those principal preparation programs. So historically Black colleges and HSIs, of course, graduate Black and Latino students, um, and those can be some, some starting points. Um, I think another starting point, too, is to also, and um, the former board member who spoke um, at the beginning of this meeting, Amanda or Ananda, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name correctly, um, she mentioned that she was not provided with the opportunity to have an exit interview. That's a missed opportunity, and that's a second strategy that can be implemented, is that the district can conduct and make it a point to conduct exit interviews for staff, um, all staff, even board members who either choose to leave or who are terminated um, to understand, or specifically if they choose to leave, to specifically understand why they are leaving. Um, because that information that they may vulnerably share can also help to develop some specific initiatives. Um, those are two that I have right off the top of my head, Jim. Um, but to be honest, though, Jim, uh, this is a challenge for <laughs> many school districts across the nation in terms of not just hiring, but retaining culturally and racially diverse staff. So Montpelier is not the only district to have this struggle or challenge. This is a nationwide issue. Um, but, but there are some strategies in place. I think lastly, um, to your question though, Jim, there has to be like an, a very open and public facing commitment from the leadership to say, hey, we are intentional about hiring diverse staff. Um, I'm going to be very transparent with you. Um, uh, about a year ago, I was considering a taking a position as a um, diversity, equity and inclusion administrator for a school district in, in this country. <laughs> and this was a school district that had very similar demographics to Montpelier, meaning that this was like a, a primarily white, rural, this was not even a suburban school district. This was a rural school district that had um, primarily white residents and stakeholders with a lot of diversity within the indigenous and Native American population. Um, when they offered me the job, Jim, I was excited. A six-figure position to do DEI work at a school district. I was like, yes. And they offered the position. I was like, yay. I gladly accepted. Like, yes, this is an opportunity for me to do work. But eventually, though, I turned down the position. And I turned down the position because I felt that as a Black woman to move in an all-white space, as a single unmarried person with a desire to get married, that would have been an issue for me. It would have also been an issue because as a black woman, I have very uh, cultural interests. <laughs> and there are things that I enjoy doing that are very, uh, uh, that resonate with my culture as a black woman. 
And I felt that if I were to accept this position, I would not have had those opportunities. Um, and I just didn't want to experience that. I did not want to experience that. And so unfortunately I turned down a position because I felt that there, the, my biggest challenge would have been cultural isolation and social isolation. And I think that is a major concern for people of color, particularly for black people, <laughs> but all people of color when making a decision to work in a primarily white space. You know, that is a question that I knew I would have had to ask myself how much, essentially, how much of my blackness would I have to sacrifice in order to be happy in this job? Now that's just me though, Jim, and, and people label me as an overthinker. So I get it. And maybe I was overthinking, but I share my, my personal story to say that I'm, my story may be very similar to other people in my position who are considering taking a teaching or admin job in the school district. While our passion may be there, while the experience and qualifications may be there, because we are not in the majority in terms of our racial identity, we have to think about questions that, you know, <laughs> white people you all may not have to think about. And that may affect people's decision to, to be employed in a particular organization. So I know I gave you the long answer there, Jim, but I, I wanted to be very transparent with you in terms of why it may be a struggle to hire and retain people of color within, within K-12. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. Um, Brett. You, based on what you just said, it may be like, like we, in the last few years, we hired a social emotional learning administrator and we're, we're very happy about that. Um, it sounds like it would be really difficult to fill a diversity, equity, and inclusion administrator, which, you know, leave that as it, as it is. Do you have examples of situations in which community members or groups of community members can help to function in that role in a in a cooperative way because I yeah. mean so, so a ways because if I mean I know that there are folks who do not feel that we're getting the job done here and they're busy people everybody's busy um, are there models or examples of um, a sort of collective efforts to sort of lead the kind of work that a DEI administrator might do? So thank you for that, Red. Um, I don't know if I would say I have any examples of models, um, but what I can do is, is, you know, have some very vulnerable and, and honest and strategic conversations with you all. Um, I think one of the things though that would need to be taken in consideration if you all are thinking about developing a role is to think about uh, the social, emotional, or even psychosocial support that may be needed for a person in that position. Um, so not just thinking about the fact that this person is employed there and you know has an office and is working nine to five, but what is happening within this person once they leave the district or once they leave work and, and they go home. So I think one of the things that should be in place is, is um, ensuring that there are sort of uh, like a holistic or wraparound supports in place for the person, especially if you all want that DEI administrator position to be occupied by a person of color. You know, that's a very real conversation, you know, um, yeah. Even while I was there in Vermont, it's like, okay, this is very beautiful, very nice, but I kind of want to go home now <laughs> because I just didn't really see too much cultural, <laughs> you know, things happening to make me want to say, hey, I would be so happy here to stay employed uh, within this district. Uh, you know, those are very real things. Um, I think the other thing too to consider, and this was another point, even within my within my reasoning to turn down this position, is I was also thinking about like uh, my safety. 
you know, see, while DEI is meaningful and even fun for me, like I enjoy doing DEI work. I'm not intimidated, but it can be intimidating, especially when people, when there are some people who take a very hostile approach to being anti-DEI. Like it's one thing to not be in support of DEI, but it's another thing to be hostile or to be aggressive or, or to even be violent or to be threatening in an anti-DEI position. And so a person who has a DEI position has to take that into consideration. That, hey, while I'm this, while this is just my work, while this is my job as a DEI administrator, I'm actually, I'm, I could potentially face threats from people because I'm showing up to work, because I'm an advocate for DEI and because I have this top level admin position within, the, within this district. And because there are some people who oppose that, I am now facing threats. That is a real thing that some people have experienced in this country. That's a real, that's a real, that's a reality. You know, and um, and I don't know how, you know, I, I'm sort of stuck on that even even within myself. And um, and again, even for me as 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 a black woman, uh, that's that's a real thing. You know, historically in this country, when when black people have stood up for social justice or, or civil rights, some people, not just black people, but some people have um, experienced physical harm because of their desire to stand up for social justice. So um, to answer your question, I, I don't have any specific models in place. I, I think given the unique um, realities that Montpelier face, I, I, think that, I think it just deserves some very specific conversations. Like if you all want to create a DEI position, you know, who is the ideal person? What identities do they occupy? And what risks does this person face in this position? Ultimately, Red, is, is also going to require you all to, to just be very transparent within talking about some very concerning DEI issues at the table. There, there needs to, to, to be that specific conversational space there. Hi, Dr. Carla. Can you hear me? My mic? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Uh, I just want to start off by thanking you for your candor right now and your willing to be your willingness to be really personal with us and your story. And I want to appreciate the fact um, that you did come to Vermont and you did come into our communities um, despite maybe feeling unsafe and um, having some trepidation about coming here and doing this work with us anyhow. And I just wanna acknowledge that and appreciate that because um, that that feels big to me. Um, and I, and none of what is before us feels like low hanging fruit. This all feels like really, really big stuff. It feels very directly connected to, you know, what is within our DEI policy, I think, um, I think this board has been in a place of deep focus uh, kind of away from our equity work because of the reality that we've been in in terms of our budget work and we've just been we've we've been forced to be a bit distracted um, from it. So I just want to really appreciate you in this report and in these recommendations, recentering this for our board because it feels like um, we really need to get back to this work. And yes, we have this big and very uh, kind of high level and encompassing DEI policy um, that I think at times we've thought about as being aspirational, aspirational and out of reach, but um, knowing that that's that's worthy. And even when we're setting the bar really high, it can force us to just keep working really hard. Um, so I just want to appreciate that you're really bringing this back um, to the board for us to look at and clearly and the stories and the narratives that you brought to us in kind of the full length report, while some being really hard and painful to hear and know that those are happening within our district, um, just getting those before this board to really understand the reality for students and uh, caregivers and families in our district, it feels really important that we have this on paper to come back and refer to, and frankly, to um, 
motivate us and keep us focused um, on this work. So I guess I have a lot of thanks and a lot of gratitude. Um, and I'm also I also appreciate you bringing in um, the Roxbury conversation, your observations. I'm I'm one of our board members that come from Roxbury, and I think that the things, the observations that you listed, feel quite true to what I hear on the ground. Um, so thank you for you know teasing those out and and getting those before us. Um, I was curious in terms of you know the opening slide. I think had demographics and you know it, it was it was specific to race, and I'm curious how kind of, you know, you said that you use lots of different frameworks and lenses to, to do the work. And I'm curious how like the socioeconomic piece kind of fits into because we don't have a lot of racial diversity clearly in Vermont or in our school district. Um, we have some socioeconomic diversity for sure. Um, and in particular, the community that I come from, you know, we have a high incidence of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. And so I'm just curious how the socioeconomic piece kind of comes into play and, and how we can be thinking about this and how we can think about outreach you know to our students and our families regarding that and even think about hiring practices when it comes to you know that identity also um and i guess in general i'm i'm also interested in like the mtss piece just like nuts and bolts and how to think about pulling you know your observations and your recommendations into that framework which is really critical in the special education services that we offer so that was long but thank you so much Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Kristen. Thank you. I, I appreciate um, your comments and, and um, your feedback. Um, let me start with the MTSS piece first. Um, first, I want to say uh, <laughs> that it was uh, to, to provide the analysis for domain six, the equity of access was not easy work. <laughs> okay. Um, and I want to begin by saying that um, to answer your question, I think to provide a, a deeper and more authentic analysis specifically related to MTSS, we need to have some deeper conversations. <laughs> um, we were able to write the report based on the data that we had. Um, however, uh, there were some, we. Uh, how do I want to say it? There we were. There were some bumping heads, and there were some um, some walls <laughs> that we were trying to knock down and tap down. So, to answer your question specifically, uh, I, I I'm actually going to just hold off on that because um, I feel that in order to to provide a deeper conversation, number one. Uh, we need more data. We uh, we were requesting access to certain data, um, and we were not receiving that that access, and for good reasons. I mean, th this is this was a dialogue, a dialogic conversation. Um, but yes, I'm just going to leave it there. That in order to provide you all with more MTSS support. Uh, there's more data that we need in order to provide a, a clearer analysis and sort of recommended course of action. Because what we provided is, um, I'll just leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Uh, the second or the first point though that you brought up around uh, sort of the socioeconomic uh, biases and things of that sort, uh, Again, we think that there is a lot of room that can happen in terms of just having conversations with Roxbury parents and families and communities. Um, you know, while I was there, I uh, visited Roxbury. I really enjoyed it. It's, it was just very different from like really anything that I've really ever seen. And to be in the school village and to speak with some of the parents and the, and um, and uh, yes, to speak with some of the parents, we think that there are lots of like what some of the parents were sharing. I was like, whoa, <laughs> like you know, how do I get all of this on paper? How do I document these issues? And it was it was just very transparent to me that as an outsider, like I'm not the only person who needs to hear this. Like There are other people within Montpelier's district leadership that needs to actually hear what these parents are saying, because I'm, I'm one person, I'm, I'm in charge of 
you know, sort of hearing their responses and documenting and analyzing, but I'm not in charge of decision-making and, and people who are in charge of decision-making need to be hearing this. So I think with Montpelier, and that's why one of the recommendations we provided, one of the first starting points, like there needs to be some more open lines of communication um, happening and that's, that's just not happening. Um, the other thing too is to think about um, how does socioeconomics play into student achievement? How does that play into teacher expectations? And how does that play into the overall um, educational performance of, of children? Is it a matter of, oh, well, because some of the families are, uh, you know, live in Roxbury and because their socioeconomic statuses are different, that they deserve different treatment? Is it that some people feel that uh, because of their socioeconomic status that they do not deserve certain resources? So is it a matter of bias and access um, or is it a combination? Um, that's, that's, left, that's left for debate. I think that there are though very, very um, crucial opportunities to have some very open and honest conversations that are, are just not happening. Um, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to say thank you very much for your, um, sharing your personal stories with us, Carla. And I think it's, it, we, um, I'm very grateful for it because you sharing what it's like to be a black woman entering our community is something that we should really hear so we can understand what it's like for people of color who do live here every single day and maybe are feeling a little bit alone and want want community and are seeking community and what what should what should we be doing those that forces us to ask ourselves what should we be doing to help provide that community for them and and you know have our whole um, school system feel like a community for every single person who goes to school here and works here. And so I wanted to say thank you for that and for all of the work that you did to, to put together this report for us. Um, I also wanted to take an opportunity to say thank you to everyone who took the time to fill out the surveys that you administered and speak with you um, because sometimes these are really difficult things to talk about. And so for people who took that time and made that time and shared their voice, I just want everyone to know we really appreciate having all of this and having heard from you. And um, that, you know, what we have here is um, really important perspectives that we don't have in many other places um, in the district, um, in the other ways that we have tried to get um, information from and, and engage with our community. So what we have here in this equity audit will be a really valuable resource, as Kristen said, for us to keep coming back to um, time and time again as we continue to push ourselves to just get better at this. Um, so wanted to, to definitely state that appreciation. Um, and I also wanted to, like, in some of the efforts that we've made, um, we have this, some of the, some of the work that we were doing, we were doing last year while you were doing the equity audit. So one thing that comes to mind for me is the work that the board did to land the specific priorities we have as a district and the indicators of success which I think are our attempts to address some of the systemic barriers. So for example, we have a top priority of academic achievement for every single student, regardless of race, socioeconomic class, ethnicity, religious backgrounds. And um, we established a, a very specific indicator of success uh, for you know around literacy and around math. What is the growth that we need to see in our student learning um, over the course of these, the next, I think, three years. Is that the kind of thing, is that, I'm just, I'm offering that as an example of maybe as Scott was saying earlier, we're sort of getting started pointed in the right direction and we still have a long way to go, but I wanted to offer that in, as part of this conversation with having you here to see, is that the kind of thing that you would say, yeah, that's, that's maybe a few steps in the right direction or no, you're, <laughs> you've, you know, you've taken a hard left and actually you should be going in this other direction. I'm, 
What's what's your expert opinion on that? Well, of course. I mean, academic achievement is should and, and should always be the number one priority. Um, if that is a priority for you all, yes, of course, absolutely. Um, I think though that there are um, um, issues that deserve attention and priority just the same. Um, but academic achievement, of course, absolutely should always be um, the the number one priority. I would say. Um, so yes, to answer your question. Um, I would also say, though, that some other priorities that deserve attention are not just related to academics if we're talking about student performance and student outcomes. Um, so one would be um, student experiences or perceptions of belonging. I mean, that's not necessarily academic focus, but that plays a part in how students show up in school in general in terms of their um, uh, experiences and perceptions. Um, another concern that also comes to mind um, could also be focused on um, discipline. Um, though that didn't come up a whole lot, that can be another area um, of priority for you all. Um, and then lastly, um, specifically issues of, of um, absenteeism um, and tardiness. So, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Well, that's, that's great to hear. The safety, belonging, and wellness is priority number two. So sure, sure, sure. <laughs> and, and attendance in there. And and attendance yeah. is part of that. And and I think that, that that's helpful to hear. Um and that okay, we're we're gonna keep doing that work. So that's yeah. very helpful to hear. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mia. Yeah. Do we have an opportunity to ask? And I, I, I see Libby, you have members of the team here. Is that are they here for the the presentation and maybe we have the only one I forced to come was Jess. The rest oh, came on their own. Wow. Because they wanted to hear Dr. Carla's presentation. Yeah. Appreciate you. And being answer any questions that yeah. the board might have too. We appreciate you all being here. Thank you. Further questions or questions of Joe? Um, thanks, Dr. Manning. Um, really appreciate it. I don't want to think, I don't want it to seem this is the only thing I pulled out of it, but I was struck by your comment about the community engagement and engaging local businesses. And I wonder what that looks like. That, that was the first time I'd kind of heard that particular strategy. And I'm, I was curious. Yeah, that's, that's always a, an ideal strategy for school districts to consider um, when thinking about um, strengthening you know, community relationships, relationships with families and parents. So essentially identifying specific um, businesses or community organizations within Montpelier that may want to have a stake in Montpelier or may want to have a partnership. Um, and, and, and folks who are business owners or who are in community agencies can partner in a variety of ways. They may serve as mentors. They can help lead extracurricular activities. Um, they can be engaged in professional development with you all. Um, there are a variety of ways. Um, I do want to add though, Jill, um, and, and you know, since you brought this up, I mean, I, I think that there are, there are some, some local movements happening within Montpelier to do more community engagement work. Um, I've actually even come across a couple of um, requests for proposals where there are, um, like there is a, a, actually two within the Montpelier area in Vermont where they're looking for consultants to do more community engagement work. So um, this is something that Montpelier that you all may want to consider because even locally, um, the city of Vermont, excuse me, the city of Montpelier is also um, is is prioritizing this as well. So, um, so yes, but uh, and then also even with the, developing some of these partnerships, again, some like say if there is a um, a business owner and this person is African American, I mean this person may potentially could serve as a volunteer teacher as a substitute teacher. Um, you know, there are a variety of ways to consider partnerships, but it begins with identifying specific businesses or organizations in the local area of the school district who may want to have a partnership with you all, um, being very clear on what that partnership may look like, um, how the partnership can benefit the student staff and caregivers of Montpelier, and then even what value may it have for the business owner. Those may be some conversations to consider um, if you all are interested in doing that kind of work.
Fred? Uh, I guess I'm trying to think of like concrete things to do. And I'm thinking that a school board, as I understand it, cannot by definition engage in a, in a difficult conversation. A school board cannot, cannot, I, I don't know how, can a school board, would a, if you had a, so unless the school board is in a strictly listening capacity, then it has to be publicly warned and publicly available. Can you have a public and difficult conversation yeah. in which people feel safe to really express what their experience is? That's a challenge. Who would be ideal candidates to represent the district in such a conversation? And how would it be conducted in a way that's safe and not necessarily public? Because right. that makes it really hard to be honest and open. Correct, correct, correct. So Red, yes, so so two, two points to that. Okay, if the board wants to have these courageous conversations with the stakeholders, I would not encourage this to happen within a space where it has to be recorded. So I'm, I, I will admit, I'm not as privy to the specific sort of policies and logistics, but in order for a board member to be involved in a public conversation, can that happen in a space where it won't go on transcript? If, if that cannot happen, then we would not recommend that because we want we want the honesty and the transparency of people to be priority. And you're right, people are not. It, it, it's just, there's no, no doubt about it. If people know that their opinions are going to be recorded or documented or transcribed in some sort of way, no, people are not going to want to be honest. I mean, that's, that's almost human nature. So that's the first element. Um, the second element though is, can there be a board member and it does not necessarily have to be a board member, but can there be a board member that can have these public conversational spaces in a in a space that is not um, relative to the district? So can it be off campus, for example? Can it be a, a monthly meetup at a local coffee uh, at a local coffee shop? Um, I'm not sure, but that's sort of the thinking that I'm having. Can it be in a gymnasium? Um, does it have to be in a space where it has to go on paper? Um, a third element, though, is that you all may um, consider creating a specific committee or a, a subcommittee of people who can initiate some of these courageous conversations. So this would be a committee of people. This can be a low stakes committee, but their sole charge is to help initiate and facilitate courageous conversations and safe space um, dialogues. Um, so this can be a committee of people and it can be a board member, it can be a parent, a teacher, it can be a combination of people. So that the only purpose is for, to bring people together to have these safe spaces with the promise and understanding that you know what happens in this space stays in this space unless we make agreements to bring it to an outsider. So there, there has to be some sort of space for, for people to say, okay, I need to express what happened to me. I need to express my concerns. I need to express my perspectives in a way where I'm not going to receive some sort of punishment or consequence as a result of me being honest. You know, I mean, even some of the things that were shared with me like some, like let, let me be honest with you all. Some some conversations, I I I had to say I want to hear this. Like I, one thing I enjoy being uh, being about with the DEI consultant, I get to also like utilize my previous journalist experience. So I just love listening to people, and I love having conversations. And while I was there, some people I said I'm going to take, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs> Because I want you to be honest about your experiences and I don't want you to minimize or water down your story because I'm recording. And if the fact that I'm recording is going to prevent you from being honest, let me stop recording. I had to say that to some people and it, like, I actually had to do that. So I, I say that to you all to say that there are some issues that some people have that they want to get out. Some people were very glad for me to be there 
Like, oh, Carla, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that we're having this conversation. Let's, yes, let's talk about this. Yes, please hear me. Listen to me. And that sort of emotion for people to be that adamant, like, yes, please, yes, document this. I mean, people were adamant. That told me that these, some people had stories that, either they were scared to share or not comfortable in sharing or did not want to share. But for them to feel comfortable to open up to me, a total stranger, I have no connection to you all outside of doing this work. They don't know me from, <laughs> from anyone else, but they decided to confide in me and share stories and their experiences. To me, that said something. That said that they, these are folks who have stories and voices that they want to be heard. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities for you all to say, hey, we need to be intentional about creating these safe spaces so that people can be heard. And I'm talking about students, I'm talking about staff and parents who had these sort of sentiments. You know, and yeah, I mean, some some place I say, hey, okay, I'm not recording. You're not recording, Carla. I'm not recording. <laughs> so I, I just want to say that to you all. Like, I love doing this work, even if like for me, it's hard, but it's like, hey, I don't care. Let's go. If I make mistakes, if it messes up, okay, let's do this. And I, I, I think even that's an area of growth for me, even as a DEI consultant, like this DEI work is going to be messy. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing this now in, in our larger, uh, you know, national politics. It's, this is messy right now. But for me, that's still not an excuse to put it on a back burner just because it's messy or just because we may make mistakes. We're human beings. <laughs> we make mistakes, we learn from our mistakes and we move forward. We move forward. And I, I think um, I think I think you all can can benefit from just saying, hey, we need to create safe spaces to listen to some of our people and actually hear what they're saying and take their voices into consideration when we're making our decisions. And and I'll 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 pause on that. I, I have a podcast. I'll <laughs> I'll go on my rants on my podcast. So, um, so, so that's, that's that. Other questions? It's got Mia. Uh, I, I appreciate that piece of context, Carla, Dr. Carla. So thanks for, for bringing that in. And then I also wanted to switch gears a little and ask a couple of questions of Libby and, um, Jess, if that's okay. Jim? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, as you've seen, this is a lot. <laughs> and my first question is just after you've had a chance to look at it and think about it, like, are there areas that you see that, like, that you would prioritize? Maybe like some of the domains or maybe some of the recommendations. Are there any ones that you would be in like your top three to five? Yeah, one of the things that uh, Carla and her team were able to give us were some resources as to how to figure out the disproportionality in our data. And Mike and team are already looking into that for us. Um, our end sizes are pretty small, as Carla was referencing mm -hmm. earlier. And so it's hard to share data when the end sizes are so small. But internally with the resource, Mike, what's the name of the author? Edward Fergus um, teaches school districts how to do that disproportionality work. Um, we didn't know how to do that before. So um, we've been digging into that to see how we can do that in a way that makes our data a little bit more public and we can see the disproportionality in it. So that was um, something we've jumped on right away. Um, the other piece that jumps out to me that we've talked about as the team a bit is how do we communicate um, our work, because there's a lot of confusion out there in communication uh, around HHB that we've talked about as a board before, you know, we can only share so much and that's not satisfactory sometimes. 
right? <laughs> to parents involved. Um, so we've, we're looking at just communication in general. I think some of the comments in the larger audit showed, um, and Carl and I have had lots of conversations about this as well, is um, communication not just to and with our um, historically marginalized families, but also some families who just don't understand decisions we're making and through the eyes of equity and don't understand why we're making them and they don't make sense to them. And so how have we communicated that out? Um, and how do we do better at that rather than just say, this is a decision based in, in an equitable mindset because mm -hmm. that's not cutting it right now, right? So that communication piece on several levels came through loud and clear in the audit and is something that the team and I are really, and the principals too, are really just thinking about and perseverating on how do you communicate well? <laughs> Seems to be an overarching theme. Um, I believe the, the, the focus group kind of idea is always something people come back to a lot. And I, and that's part of the communication piece. And it's something I reflect on quite a bit. Um, we haven't had much success there in the past. And so, um, but we keep, people keep coming back to it. We keep coming back to this idea of focus groups. So is it worthwhile? And, and if it is, then how do we make it successful? so that um, it's worth people's time, yeah. right? Um, those are the big things that jumped out at me. Jess or team, do you wanna add anything else to the conversation? We've The Ferguson book has been really influential thus far for the central office team. Yeah, I mean, I, Jess, come on up here. <laughs> Weird, <laughs> I wanna really capture your voice. Um. You know, I, I feel like for us, as we've talked about um, a leadership team and how to think about this work, um, it feels like right now the work is really around um, listening um, and considering the perspectives that were shared um, and thinking about how to move this work forward through really collaborative and really intentional and thoughtful ways um, so that it's not done in silos or it's not started and there's missteps, but it really becomes a part of our like authentic foundational work and how we approach what we do here at MRPS. Um, and so for me, a large part of that is uh, communication as Libby was talking to and really being able to open communication and open up space for um, voices to be heard and how we do this work. I think we're making a lot of good, good strides too with the, Jess, the, the work that Nick and Jess have been doing with their um, belonging survey data from students. You know, this is our first year at doing that. Um, and some of the information, you know, I always say data is information, not condemnation. I think I stole that from somebody, so don't quote me on it, but um, I can't remember who I stole it from. Uh, and and sometimes we see it still as condemnation, right? So um, we need to see it as information in places that we can grow and learn. And just what Dr. Carla was just saying that everybody, including I, she didn't list us in there, but I would include administrators need to need to be able to feel safe in order to do this work. Um, and so if we're going to lead the work, then we have to feel safe in doing that work as well. Um, and so do our teachers and so do our students and so do our, our caregivers. So and it is really tricky, hard work. Um, we wanted to do this audit because we've had so many stops and starts with our work around equity, some for good reason, and some, you know, some because they, we just haven't found the right claw to, you know, thing to grab our claws into. Um, so now I think the team has some better ideas, and we have a we have a different team around us as well with our leadership. So. Is keep thinking about particular, you know, the story that Carla shared about the, just the feelings that she had being in our community. If there's any ideas you have about um, supporting our staff, particularly our BIPOC staff, um, because we do have we do have them, and um, and yet they might not see themselves reflected in their colleagues very much. And so is there, are there any thoughts that you have for ensuring, not ensuring, but supporting um, staff wellness, particularly for BIPOC staff? Yeah, I mean, this is a big, big conversation that I've had a lot this year um, around how do we 
retain staff of color because it is something that I think obviously we all think is really important and we want to commit to. Um, and I think, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to, I think it's really important to bring in a wider variety of voices and stakeholders to make those decisions, um, because I'm not sure us as a siloed sort of admin team can really sort of right now, um, without having more voices at the table, um, present some really particular commitments around how we're going to strategize uh, staff of color and retention. But I know that is something that we've been talking about, and I've been talking with other people um, in the room who are not administrators um, as well. So it's certainly something on our radar. Yeah, I think uh, adding to that, you know, that's a place where some sort of, and maybe a role for the, some sort of outreach of the community in terms of making a welcoming community in general. Cause I think if, even if we create a great environment in district, if, you know, staff of color are feeling isolated or displaced or, you know, not welcome the community at large, that could be another factor that makes it makes them hard to attract them or hard to retain them. So, um, you know, working with the community in general to make it a welcoming place and figuring out ways to do that. Carla just got her hand raised. <laughs> Carla, you can That's just jump in. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I, I wanted to bring up an example actually from um, another client, and um, this is a, a black woman um, who was a an administrator for a school a school district as a charter school, and um, we were kind of joking about this, but we were talking about what staff wellness may look like, particularly for BIPOC staff. And, um, and I was asking her to share with me, like, you know, what sort of wellness, like self-care wellness is, is your charter school doing for you all as staff? And she says, oh, they're doing so many things. Like they go, you know, um, hiking and they, you know, doing like this indoor gym. And I said, well, that sounds like fun. I don't know if I was fun with that. And she said, she now this is a black woman. She says, girl, I do not want to do no hiking with these white people. <laughs> and I said, but it's nature. You're going outside and everything. She says, I don't want to do that. I do not want to do that. I said, okay, what is something like, what is an ideal, like if your superintendent can say what an ideal self-care day would look like for you, what does that entail? She says it does not involve hiking. It involves massage, listening to some nice jazz music, uh, maybe, you know, a spa day, you know, facial beauty treatment with the mimosa, et cetera, et cetera. Tyler, we're not buying people mimosa. <laughs> Sorry. We can't, we can't do that. No, Morgan. No, not happening. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Uh, but, but I, you know, I shared that example uh, very lightheartedly, but to say, and, and this is to Jess's point that if, if you all want to have some specific conversations around um, staff retention, particularly for BIPOC staff, um, you, you all may benefit just by having those direct conversations with your staff uh, very directly, you know, what, what might some um, wellness or ideal self-care and wellness look like? Um, I think that's that's very very important um, to uh, to do. That that that's something that could be very helpful. And maybe no mimosas. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I'd like to keep my job. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a question. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the panorama tool that we have and, you know, a lot of surveying happened through this process and we now have this kind of tool in the tool belt for the district and <clears throat> there have been intentions around using panorama in terms of family surveys, caregiver surveys and other, and I'm curious how kind of what we have received from the equity audit, how that can be applied to the types of questions that we're asking in that surveying or like how flexible is panorama For caregivers yeah as an example and then can we or is the plan to also use that to survey students and i think that's where the belonging we are surveying students yeah with the with the so belonging. In, in maybe both of those and the caregivers and the students like how could we take this and kind of apply that right. to the survey work that nick and i were just actually looking at that just today very quickly, um, because the caregiver council that I work with, yep. or who I work with, is working on the survey now, um, and we have some say in what we can ask. They're pretty 
they're pretty standard surveys. Mm -hmm. um, with like we can choose from questions that have been normed. Yep. Um, through their work, uh, but we can also put in open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I believe when we're creating surveys, we can put in open-ended questions at the end that that we create mm -hmm. um, for people. And I think that's where our biggest opportunity is. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, cause I haven't seen this piece of it. I'm not not sure about, just might actually know, know this, put you on the spot. If you can collect demographic data of respondents. I think that's an option. I assume that would be an option. We do it for students, but that's based on their um, like ID number, yeah. so. Yeah. So we'll, we have to look into that piece. Um, but the nice piece about the belonging data is we can break it down by demographics to look at disproportionality um, around belonging data in our in our district. Yeah, we're digging into that piece right now. The caregiver council is actually we meet tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday um, about which questions we want to include in the survey because you don't want to make it too long or else people aren't going to do it. Right. Yeah. So we want to, we were talking about what are the priority questions we're going to ask. Mm -hmm. And then that group will analyze it and we'll get the results up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Tim? Question would be for sort of as a board to check back in on, you know, where progress, what we're thinking on this. I know this is probably the uh, meat and potatoes of the equity subcommittee's work, um, but I guess what should we be thinking in terms of when, when, when and how we should check back in? And I guess I should have started by saying, um, Dr. Manning, thank you very much. Very informative and insightful presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, yeah, sure. So just, what, what do you think? I think we definitely intend to check back on this pretty regularly. Um, well, one of my first thoughts is that that when we get our data presentations from the team, from Libby and her team three times a year, we should keep making sure that th that they're you know doing that disproportionality now that they're getting stronger in those skills so that we can see whether or not we are achieving academic achievement for everyone or if there is disproportionality in the students that are succeeding and the students that are having a harder time so that that happens three times a year so that's that's the first thing off the top of my head and then i think the second thing would be this is definitely the work of the equity committee to say what are the recommendations here that that in addition to that what we're, we're already doing that we would take on and say yeah. let's what do we should we do next like Communication and engagement, it would be, a, I think, sounds like a really good one for us to focus on. Um, and so what does progress look like over the next one to five years on that? And then we'll check in. Yeah, now we have a, a reference point to kind of go back to this report and ask where progress is being made and, you know, what's being implemented. I mean, I know a lot of stuff is being implemented now, but, you know, how we made progress and use this as a benchmark. I know we're approaching 8.30. Um, other comments or questions? No, well, thank you, Dr. Manning. This has been super helpful. We really appreciate all the hard work that went into this, um, as well as just the great and thoughtful feedback and, and um, your candor, your presentation. It was fantastic. And uh, I really appreciate all the information and the frankness um, uh, and the laughter as well. It was good to... <laughs> Good to get some some good stories and and bring some levity to a, I know a topic that can be um, uh, sometimes charged, but you know that we're all I think wrestling with and um, looking forward to moving forward on. So uh, thank, you. thank you much, and thanks also to everyone who participated, the equity committee, um, the administration, and everyone who uh, stepped up to do the service. And thank you, Myron, for keeping things going behind the scenes. Myron is the organizer. Absolutely. <laughs> Very much appreciate that. Him and Anna have You're a lot welcome. in common. No problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you. You're thank welcome. you all for the opportunity. Yes. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you all for the opportunity. 
um, Libby, let's stay in contact and um, let's stay connected. But yes, thank you all. Thank you all for everything. Thanks, Kyle. It was nice to meet you all for the ones in person. It was also very nice to meet you all in person just as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you all. We are departing at this time. So you all have a good evening. Okay. okay. Thanks again. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh, so final agenda is policy monitoring reports of approval of three. Uh, E1, um, Title I, Part A, Parent Involvement, uh, F3, Fire and Emergency Preparedness Drills, and F4, Access Control and Visitor Management. Do you have a motion to approve those three reports? I move to approve the policy monitoring reports for E1, F3, and F4. I do have a second. Any discussion or questions? Quick question on yeah. E1. It seemed like there was some, what's the scope of that update that you're recommending? It's Libby? big. Is it? It's a, yeah. And the policy committee started working on it. If I remember last spring, Jim, um, I'm looking at you because you yeah, were on that, but it's a major change. Like our, that policy is very much out of date. So it, it should probably be a priority for the policy committee. Yeah, um, we are going to meet soon. I sent yeah. out a doodle. So. Yeah, we were looking at, Franklin Northeast has a really good model example. Um, but yeah, that needs to be updated. No, no, it goes from like two paragraphs to like five pages. <laughs> I have a question on the... Um, access control and visitor management. I noticed in at Union Elementary and at Main Street Middle School, there are now two buzzers mm -hmm. to buzz. Will that happen at MHS? There or is, aren't plans, I okay. don't believe, to do that. Okay. It's expensive. It's shockingly expensive. And why did, what, so why did we do it at those two Because places? there's less security there. Because the main entrances are farther away from the, main, the offices. So we wanted to, that egress, yeah. piece. Um, so if you remember a couple of years ago, we built a second set of doors in main street. There was only one set of doors okay. and we built the second set of doors for a safety piece. We also did that at UES just recently. Okay. And the reason is because it, when you walk in, you know, at main street or Montpelier high school and at Roxbury village school, you walk in right to the office. They can right. see you right away, but in the other two buildings, you can't, especially at main street. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Are there any other questions? Uh, all's in favor of the approving the policy monitor reports? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, that passes. I think motion to adjourn, and we're almost dead even at 8.30. We do have a motion to adjourn. Uh, do have a second. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> <Dang>. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> Good night. I'll abstain. <laughs>